Today we've got um, Nick Jacobs and Sid Milkis talking about building a conservative state, partisan polarization, and the redeployment of administrative power. All right, well, thank you so much. We're thrilled to be here um, to get some feedback on this work as we're beginning to think about how to expand it. The paper that we circulated is forthcoming in Perspectives on Politics, a special edition I think, called Trump Causes and Consequences. Yeah, I wrote it down. Yeah. Right? And uh, this is Causes co-authored work with Des King at Oxford, and then uh, Sid and I have been working on this for about a year. And in this paper, uh, this is really our attempt to offer a new conceptual framework to understand the origins and development of the American state. Um, such a new approach, we suggest, is necessary in light of the current administration seeming defiance of some of the most prominent theories in American politics, theories related to presidential power, uh, executive power, and also bureaucratic management and implementation. But more broadly, we're seeking to cast new light on some of the foundational questions of modern political life in the United States. Who governs? Who or how are public officials held accountable? And then this recurrent question in American political development, what does statism look like in a country that ostensibly prescribes national administrative power? But to start, uh, we'll go a little bit more narrow and begin with an example of some recent administrative action that we think raises all sorts of challenges to extant theory about bureaucratic policy making and implementation. This policy was put into effect by an agency within the division of the Department of Health and Human Services, the Office, office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, most of you might recall the many news stories you've heard over the past year about the Office of Refugee Res and Resettlement, or the ORR, uh, as the primary federal office responsible for taking care of children detained at the border, ORR was on the front lines of the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy for separating children from their parents at the border. It was tasked with the difficult responsibility of managing the overcrowded detention facilities set up to take care of migrant children from small infants to young adults. Now, the ORR has existed since 2003, and it has been the federal agency responsible for taking care of ch children migrants in various forms, though, since the 1970s. And while recent stories have focused, we think, rightly and understandably on the most vulnerable populations, it's important to point out, uh, as this slide begins to document, that for the, at least the past seven years, the majority of child migrants served by ORR has been between 15 and 17 years old. Moreover, the ORR has had to cope with changing migration patterns to serve migrants primarily coming from Central and Latin America. Only 5% of children that make their way into ORR custody come from a country other than Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, or Honduras. And while the socioeconomic background of child migrants has not really changed over the last few years, the ORR has faced increasing demands. In 2016, ORR received a record 59,000 children into its care, operating with a budget just marginally larger than it had in 2012 when it took care of just 13,000 children. So amid all these mounting pressures, this makes ORR's primary mission to place children that are detained at the border with families. ORR does not try to provide services directly for children in camps on a long-term basis. Rather, it has the responsibility to get them out of direct care and into civil society. And to do this, ORR relies on a network of state and local welfare agencies, private nonprofits, for-profit contractors, and simply just volunteers willing to take children into their home. Now, what we find interesting is in that in doing this, ORR looks just like many federal agencies embedded in America's peculiar administrative state. Its actions blur the boundary between private and public. Its responsibility bleeds over into different agencies. There's really no direct line of command and control and somehow civil servants are able to adapt to increased budgetary constraints. What is unusual, and what we think we have a difficult time trying to explain with current theory, is that the ORR has also had to respond to the politicization of the bureaucracy. 
forced to carry out White, White House directives that change the way civil servants go about their normal day-to-day -day operations in order to better serve the partisan or ideological purposes of the president. Last April, the Trump administration issued a six-page memorandum of understanding that called for a new form of information sharing between ORR, which sits within the Health and Human Services Department, and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and Customs and Border Protection, housed in the Department of Homeland Security. Specifically, ORR agreed to provide ICE with immigration status information for every member of a family in which they placed a child. Now to date, this information sharing agreement has led to nearly 200 arrests of unauthorized migrants who took a child into their care. Now to be clear, there's a lot we don't know about this enforcement tactic. Most of these detentions have not proceeded to trial, nor do we know if any children were any, in, in any degree of danger or if any adults arrested had criminal records. But what interests us is the redeployment of ORR personnel and resources in the service of the Trump administration's deportation policies. In our reckoning, traditional theories of policy making and policy implementation in the bureaucracy don't account for this repurposing. This is an agency in health and human services, the pillar of the federal welfare state. Yet it has been enlisted in Homeland Security's program of detaining unauthorized migrants. Most theories of bureaucratic design, such as Terry Moe's work on the obstacles to education reform, emphasize how rigid agencies are, their inertia and resistance to change, how years later they still benefit the same coalition that was behind their original enactment. This was a rapid and consequential change that poses hard challenges to that idea. Furthermore, this policy seems to contradict the standard view of Daniel Carpenter and others about bureaucratic autonomy of key civil servants, uh, which comes from their specialization and political networks. The ORR HHS memorandum was highly political designed and implemented by political appointees, directed by the White House, and even though this memorandum has all the trappings of quote unquote good government, cost efficiencies, expedited processing, caring for children, it's clear that this is a political directive in pursuance of the president's policy preferences. And finally, this doesn't fit into the major framework offered up by scholars of institutions and political behavior for understanding how Democrats and Republicans battle over the administrative state. This is not a conservative coming in and rolling back welfare agencies. The simple yet surprisingly persistent story that liberals expand government while conservatives seek to retrench it cannot account, we argue, for the aggressive use of government power we see here. And, and we also furthermore believe that our alternative framework helps us to better understand the institutional side of the behavioral story Aiken and Bartel's document, the myth of the median voter, and the actuality of the highly polarized activist party voter seeking government to act on behalf of their preferences. So above all, our paper challenges the conventional wisdom that equates the arrival of a new conservative administration in Washington, D.C. with efforts to retrench the federal government. And Exhibit A is Donald Trump. During his first year and a half in office, now two years, the Trump administration has eagerly wielded the power of the American state to secure his pledge to make America great again. His actions defy the standard frame that the two major parties engage in this partisan battle to <clears throat> expand or roll back the state. Instead, Trump seeks to redeploy, and that is our main operator throughout this paper and throughout our framework, to redeploy national administrative resource power for conservative causes. In Homeland Security, ORR is an illustrative example against undocumented immigrants that have been systematically ratcheted up across the government. In trade, where Trump has eschewed free markets for tariffs, an active and aggressive use of the state on behalf of his policy. In healthcare, which as we'll expand on later in the talk, in imposing work requirements for Medicaid recipients, and in criminal justice 
where bipartisan efforts to reform the carceral state had been compromised by a series of actions that marked the reemergence of quote unquote law and order. Of course, most scholars and pundits, especially never Trump intellectuals and Republicans, place Trump outside of the tradition of American conservative thought. That's good, good. So triumphal. <laughs> no, no, it's good. We like the triumphal march, yes. <laughs> build the wall, build the wall. Sorry. No, no. And, and many view Trump as a disruptive force, right? Who's indifferent, if not badly hostile to his party. Um, but as Sid is going to explain, and as we go through in the paper, we argue that this association uh, of conservative republicanism and retrenchment fails to recognize a critical change, a change beginning in the 1960s in the relationship between party politics and executive power, a joining of mobilization and executive prerogative, such that partisanship in the United States is no longer a struggle over the size of the state, it has become a battle for the services of national administrative power. And despite rhetorical appeals to limited government, since the 1960s, conservatives have, saw, have sought <coughs> national administrative power just as ardently as liberals. But whereas liberals seek to build administrative capacity to design and implement social welfare policies, conservatives have sought to redeploy and extend that power in pursuit of their own partisan objectives, most notably in the areas of criminal justice, national and homeland security. And with redeployment, conservative presidents sustain state spending and activity, but in service to the new administration's ideology. <clears throat> Thanks, Nick. Um, so I'm going to try. Uh, put this in some historical context as Nick Segue to me su suggested. So w we trace the, this battle for the services uh, of the administrative state. I can't figure out whether I want to wear my glass or not today. I think when I have less than five hours sleep, I wear them. <laughs> so uh, we trace it back to the 60s when the New Deal political order, anchored by what Arthur Schlesinger Jr. famously and probably too optimistically called the vital center, fell apart. Uh, the idea that this, the state first uh, uh, gained legitimacy with the creation of the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt and during uh, the early days of the Cold War provides uh, some important background uh, to the 1960s. Uh, in our view, the development of the modern American state uh, during the Great Dep Depression and World War II involved not just the creation of new administrative agencies, as important as that was, but a new public philosophy. And uh, in his iconic 1941 State of the Union address, uh, FDR argued that America's traditional freedoms, like speech and religion, needed to be supplemented by two new essential freedoms, as he put it, freedom from want uh, and freedom from fear. Uh, and this was not mere rhetoric. Uh, up there, here you see illustrations uh, by Norman Rockwell, the famous illustrator of uh, freedom from want and freedom from uh, fear um, that appeared on the cover of the very popular Saturday Evening Post uh, in consecutive editions in 1944. And that was an important symbol and contributed to these new freedoms becoming part of American uh, folklore. But uh, more concretely, Freedom from fear was embodied by the national security state, later extended uh, to the homeland security state. Uh, uh, and then, and while freedom from want uh, took institutional form uh, in domestic programs like Social Security, uh, the foundation of the, of the New Deal welfare state. Uh, these commitments, the charter of, modern, of, of the modern American state, uh, were not subject to partisanship, Roosevelt argued. But, as he put it in one of his important speeches at the Commonwealth Club in, in San Francisco, uh, these freedoms required enlightened administration. They required the creation of an executive-centered administrative state that would, uh, that would supplant limited constitutional government and the decentralized uh, party politics that, accommod that accommodated limited constitutional government. And tempered by economic crisis and total war, as Schlesinger puts it, uh, American politics uh, was imbued with pragmatic policymaking, which became the hallmark of policymaking through the Kennedy administration. 
the enactment of the 1939 uh, Executive Reorganization Act, which only I've written about, I think, uh, which was enacted only after a two-year pretty bloody battle uh, in Congress, uh, that created the White House office, the West Wing, as it's now known, uh, and strengthened the president's control over the expanding administrative core. And as such, I, I consider it the organic statute uh, of, of the New Deal state. Now, to make a long story sh uh, short, probably not short sure enough, but uh, to, let's, uh, I have to be rather schematic here. The New Deal state was torn apart during the culture wars uh, of the 60s. Uh, as liberalism expanded to more polarizing causes like social justice and anti-imperialism, conservative Democrats and Republicans who prior to the late 60s viewed this executive-centered administrative state as an existential threat to constitutional government gradually came to embrace administrative power. And this began in 1964 as, as a roar in the wilderness. Uh, Senator Barry Goldwater's 1964 campaign summoned an aggressive messianic version of conservatism, uh, notably in the all-encompassing struggle against communism. Uh, and I remember these words powerfully because I'm older uh, than, than all of you, even you, I think, Jim. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, we'll talk about that <laughs> later. So Goldwater said uh, famously at the 1964 convention in San Francisco, I would remind you that extremi extremism and defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also, Goldwater continued, that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. Now it's significant, we can talk about this in the Q&A, that those uh, apocalyptic words were written by Harry Jaffa, who was the intellectual godfather uh, uh, of most of the prominent academics who support President Trump. Um, Goldwater's crusade marked an important precursor to Richard Nixon's presidency, which first advance, advanced an alternative version of administrative power. Uh, since Nixon, self-styled conservative administrations have sought to redeploy rather than dismantle or roll back state power uh, to serve conservative causes and policies. So, uh, in, in, in grappling with this uh, new framing, uh, we've, uh, I've been uh, struggling uh, with Nick and, and Des about what exactly a state means. And um, I'm kind of um, scandalized by how frivolously the term state is used in, in the literature. And oftentimes people confound uh, a, the state and government, and I think they're different. Um, I, I, for one thing, ideology is really central uh, to understanding the contemporary dynamics of state development. And that suggests that the idea of a state cuts more deeply than suggested by Max Weber's classic definition of, as he put it, a human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. But we believe that a, when one thinks about a state, you have to think, of something that goes beyond the powers of government. And, and to us, the state represents a centralizing ambition to cultivate or impose a certain idea and practice of citizenship, to impose a certain idea and practice of what it means to be an American. Now, of course, these ideas of American identity have, has, have historical roots. You can trace them back to the beginning of the Republic. But with the cosmic crack up of the 60s, as Hugh Hecklow puts it, they've become a more routine part of politics in the United States. Uh, and these culture, culture wars gave rise to two competing versions uh, of the national state, which animate the rancorous struggle between conservatism and liberalism and fueled Donald Trump's remarkable ascent to the White House. Now, put most simply, and that's why we have these images up here, liberals dedicated themselves to freedom from want, while conserva conservatives embraced freedom from fear. Uh, but that's a little bit too simple a framing, although I think it is really helpful to think about that. Because the meaning of, uh, of these ideals were significantly transformed by the uh, existential struggle over American identity that, that came out of the 1960s. So let me just talk about these two ideas of the state and practice of the state. 
post-New Deal liberalism followed from the fraught but effective alliance between Lyndon Johnson and the Civil Rights Movement. And liberal activists adopted a view of the American uh, state uh, after the New Deal by the 1970s that envisage, envisaged a cosmopolitan, pluralistic society whose government would protect the rights of African Americans, women, immigrants, and later the LBT, uh, LBT, uh, LBT Q uh, uh, community at home and, and pursue global policies of trade and uh, diplomacy abroad to advance not materialism, but human rights. Uh, and this ideal mo manifested itself most uh, fully in the social causes championed by the great society. Uh, and in, in a sense, these social causes displaced uh, uh, or were layered upon uh, the, ec uh, the economic issues that dominated the New Deal. On the whole, there was, I think, a dimension, uh, a displacement of the New Deal dimension of conflict uh, from economic to, culture, to cultural issues. Um, uh, the attempt to realize, uh, and with this, the attempt to realize the great society exposed uh, the liberal state's central fault lines, national security and race. And with violent upheaval in Vietnam and in the nation's core, the pragmatic center that, that really buttressed the New Deal state fell apart. That is the, the state which we label freedom from want. Goldwater's call, the conservative embrace of freedom from fear, for a more unyielding struggle against communism uh, advanced the contemporary conservative movement's right, rightward shift. Uh, fellow crusaders rejected the liberal state as an insidious form of despotism that would destroy rugged individualism at home and America's exceptional global place. And along with communism, the principal demon of conservatives' apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic vision was urban unrest and rioting uh, during the long hot, hot summers of the late 1960s. Gold, Goldwater, therefore, got, preached the gospel of law and order that would become a rallying cry of conservatives' redeployment of, of state power. And of course, Vegela Weaver, who I dearly miss, has written extensively about uh, law and order as a front lash. In, in American politics, and, and this in, in some ways is an attempt to elaborate on that idea. So uh, let us go to, to, to this holy trinity here <laughs> of Goldwater, and Nixon, and, and Reagan. Uh, although Goldwater was the prophet of conservative statist ambition, it was Nixon who wielded the promise of American exceptionalism uh, and, uh, and, and law and order, who welded the promise of American except, exceptionalism and law and order to state power. Goldwater, although he was messianic in his message, was, was very diffident in, about uh, executive and national power. He viewed the twin diseases of communism abroad and domestic unrest at home of, as symptoms of an executive-centered administrative state that had to be fervently resisted. But by 1968, the traditional faith in limited constitutional government had faded considerably. By the time Nixon took office, uh, the modern presidency was, was, was linked with the quagmire in Vietnam and three summers of rioting in northern cities. And that severely tested the nation's resolve and tested conservatives' commitment to limited constitutional government. And one of the things that's most important about Nixon's presidency is how he coupled conservative insurgency think of the Southern strategy, uh, to the promise of presidential power, uh, an institution originally designed to protect and extend the vision of, pro of the programmatic liberal cause was recast uh, as, as something that could advance conservative causes. So ideologically, as, as, I, as I like to put it, I've been stubborn about putting it this way for a long time. <laughs> uh, ideologically, Nixon uh, believed the modern presidency could be a double-edged sword. Uh, and, and that's what this quote is all about. Just for fun, I'll, I'll just read the quote. Uh, the, the, days, uh, uh, the days of the passive presidency belong to the, a simpler past, uh, as, as he told the 19, uh, as, as he said during his 1968 campaign. Let me be very clear about this. That he must uh, articulate the nation's values, define its goals, and marshal its will. 
And under a Nixon administration, the presidency will be deeply involved in the entire sweep of America's public concerns. And these were not just words. Nixon acted on these words. On, on entering office, he reorganized rather than curtailed uh, the executive aggrandizement of the Johnson years. And so Goldwater and Nixon laid the groundwork for the conservative state. But Ronald Reagan and his self-styled heir apparent George W. Bush further advanced policies in a critical way that would, they, they argued, remedied the New Deal state's failure to uphold private property, property, to protect family values, and to effectively fight foreign enemies on, uh, of the American way of life. Uh, Johnson enlisted civil, the civil rights movement or in, uh, civil rights organizations as the foot soldiers of a new liberalism. Reagan forged an alliance with the Christian right, which became the core constituency uh, in the push for a kind of conservative nationalism. So by the end of the Reagan presidency, the frame of partisanship had been transformed in two critical ways, setting the stage for the battle over the direction uh, of the national state. First, the locus of party politics shifted from cities, counties, states, and Congress to the presidency. Uh, Tip O'Neill's refrain that all politics of local, all politics is local, um, no longer held, held uh, was, was really compelling, if it ever really was an accurate description of American party politics. Uh, and, and, and in the wake of the 60s, uh, by the 70s, Democrats and Republicans came to depend on presidents and presidential candidates to raise funds, to mobilize grassroots support, to articulate the party's message, uh, and to advance party programs. So one important change was the, the shift of the, local, of the locus of partisanship uh, from, a, from a localized partisanship to a presidency-centered partisanship. Second, uh, Democrats and Republicans no longer fought over whether there should be a, a large national government tasked with extensive responsibilities. That struggle, which dominated the Roosevelt years, was replaced by a battle for the services flowing from the national administrative state. So why redeployment? Um, why, why does this uh, change uh, take place in the framework uh, of American politics? Our, our central point is that the alternative visions uh, of the state joined to an executive-centered partisanship uh, animate contemporary developments in American politics. And beyond its distribu uh, dis distributional effects, which are very important, uh, redeployment opens up new possibilities uh, for partisan control and for partisan contestation. And so let me just mention two so somewhat uneasily related ways this is done. Uh, first, we argue uh, redeployment is joined uh, to the movement politics that arose in the 60s and transformed the terms of partisan engagement. Uh, social movements that grew out of, uh, of the civil rights revolution of the 60s including but not limited to feminism, environmentalists, welfare rights advocates, and the LGBTQ community, spawned public interest groups during the 1970s, and they developed institutional partnerships with bureaucratic agencies, congressional committees, and courts over the next four decades. By the late 70s, administration and presidential pronouncement had become the new battlegrounds of social movement reform. And when a for former community organizer sat in the White House, social activists, especially immigration rights and L LGBTQ activists, pressured Obama to use state power on behalf of marginalized groups, voices representing, they, they claim, those who had not yet become full me members of the American community as envisioned by liberal reform. And conservative social movements also strategically depend on state power. Uh, conservative anti-liberalism evolved from an attack on the administrative state to a strategy that involved the creation of parallel institutions to redeploy the levers of national power. And Ronald Reagan used the Office of Public Liaison, which is housed in the West Wing, to effectively tie the president's political fortunes to the emergent 
but powerful forces of anti-abortion, family value conservative activists. And George W. Bush, in a range of decisions on abortion success, stem cell research, uh, and LGBTQ rights, uh, sought to harness the grassroots base and to sustain their energy. So the first aspect of this redeployment is mobilization and connecting presidents to what is now uh, conventionally referred to as the base. But secondly, and, and, this, and paradoxically, uh, presidential mobilization, uh, which has privileged the, re uh, the relationship between the White House and partisan bases, has been joined to administrative tactics that are, as the literature often puts it, camouflaged. In fact, there is a prodigious, as, as De that's a Des King word. This is a word, prodigious, <laughs> word that, for, that, that that's, uh, uh, an Oxford Don would use. There's a prodigious uh, scholarship that has shown that much of American government is sub submerged, uh, delegated, or uh, done in states and localities, or even by non-governmental agents. Uh, and yet is, it is conservative administrative power used on behalf of the, of the president's ideological goals. And importantly, these administrative, uh, these camouflaged actions have been de deployed especially, these indirect methods have been deployed especially by conservative partisans uh, seeking to reconcile their anti-government rhetoric with statist ambitions. Uh, for example, contracting out has been a, a huge part of the Bush 43 and, and, the, um, and the Trump administration. So, did you? Yeah, so, uh, so this is a summary of actions uh, uh, taken by the Trump administration. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through all these, but I wanted you to see a summary of them. And, and we can talk about any of these uh, in the Q&A, which will which we'll start uh, um, in just a bit. Um, despite his relative experience, uh, Trump uh, and a strategist recognized the importance and relish, and relish the exercise of partisan administration. And Trump has talked a, a lot about erasing Obama's legacy, uh, but that is more than personal recrimination. Some of it is, but it's more than that. His presidency builds on the sustained reliance of Reagan and Bush 43 and Obama on executive-centered partisanship. In fact, so far did Obama push the administrative uh, envelope, especially in health care and immigration rights policy, that after the Republicans assumed command of the House uh, in, in the 2010 elections, uh, GOP strategists began to eagerly anticipate that the next president their party elected uh, would, as, as one GOP strategist put it, seize the loaded administrative gun I think he said weapon, uh, that Obama had left uh, in the Oval Office. Uh, now, Obama's resort to administrative action to advance his, his objectives is understandable from a political point of view, uh, particularly during his second term when he not only didn't have uh, Democrats controlling the House, but also uh, the Senate as well. So during his second term especially, he, he sought to use administrative power to strengthen a widely scattered but to potentially powerful coalition of the ascendant, as Ronald Brownstein calls it. Uh, that is millennials, minorities, the LB, uh, LGBTQ community, and educated professionals, especially sing, single women, which, which Jen takes a, a look at so carefully. Uh, you could call this the maturing, or his effort to, to lead to the maturing of the great society's uh, uh, constituencies. Uh, as a candidate, uh, Trump denounced the Obama administration's, as he put it, major power grabs of authority. But as president, he's not only rescinded Obama-era actions, uh, he has re redeployed administrative power to serve conservative uh, 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 objectives. And as this slide shows, this has involved advancing policies uh, that, that uphold freedom from fear and recasting those dedicated from freedom, uh, uh, de those dedicated to freedom from want, to more conservative policies. Uh, so you think about things like restricting restroom accessibility for transgender students, rescinding Title IX guidelines for colleges and universities, and removing LGBTQ protections with government uh, uh, contractors, uh, uh, 
the, the regulations Obama put in place that made government contractors comply uh, with uh, LGBTQ rights. Um, that, that, all those actions did, did not involve removing or reducing the state's presence. By the stroke of the presidential uh, pen, some groups lost while others gained in affirmative administrative action. Now, Trump has also uh, taken actions in the states, uh, most of which are controlled by Republicans, uh, or, or especially before the 2018 election. We can talk about how that might change things a bit. Um, uh, to redeploy resources for conservative objectives. And I'm gonna, just gonna spend the last uh, few minutes of my talk talking about the way the Trump administration has repurposed Obamacare uh, because I think it sheds new light on, on, their, on the Trump administration on the Affordable Care, Care Act. Uh, and this, the, the action they've taken complements conservatives' remaking of welfare policy during the Clinton uh, presidency. Uh, the Trump administration uh, has issued waivers uh, for Medicaid work requirement uh, rules. Uh, after the Republicans failed to repel, uh, repeal and replace Obamacare, uh, Trump resorted to an administrative approach to recast a centerpiece of the Affordable Care Act. And, and by that I mean the extension of Medicaid benefits to those with annual incomes of below 138% of the federal po uh, poverty level. This was the most redistributive part of the Affordable Care Act. And most of the enrollment in the Affordable Care Act has been through this expansion uh, of Medicaid. Now, following uh, uh, several behind closed door meetings at the White House, the director of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, sent a letter to state Medicaid directors uh, last January, uh, January of 2018, encouraging states to develop new rules requiring able-bodied enrollees to seek work as a condition of receiving Medicaid benefits. It won't surprise you that most of the states that have been reacting to this invitation are red states. Uh, and this is uh, a way that they have uh, reluctantly agreed to extend Medicaid benefits uh, by recasting the program as a more conservative policy. Uh, the day after that letter went out, the day after uh, um, Kentucky's request for such a waiver, uh, which had sat dormant for two years going back to the Obama administration, was processed and the waiver was, a, was approved so Kentucky could redo their Medicaid uh, program along the lines of, of establishing some kind of work accountability. Now, it's true, as in many of, of the, the Trump administrative actions, uh, that, uh, that the courts have, have halted this policy a bit. Uh, a federal dis district court put a stop to Kentucky's plan this past June, in June 2018. It ruled because Kentucky received permission only the day, only the day after formally announcing a policy change that administrative procedures governing, governing public comment were violated. This is a big part of Rachel, of, of, of Rachel Potter's work, the importance of these uh, public comments in the regulatory process. And the court, district court ruled the Trump administration violated those in, in, in approving Kentucky's plan. But rather than appeal that decision, somebody in the Trump administration <laughs> understands public administration. Rather than do that, the Trump administration decided that it would re simply reopen public, uh, uh, public comments and uh, both Kentucky and federal officials, officials are currently uh, drafting their response uh, to over 11,000 uh, comments submitted. Um, but as, as we know, if you study public administration carefully, this process where the administrative agencies interpret public comments advantages the federal agencies. So uh, in the meantime, as, um, the White House, White House officials have given permission to three other states to impose work requirements, Arkansas, Indiana, and New Hampshire, as this slide shows. Uh, and given the greater time period that transpired before their request uh, was issued, these do not face a, a legal challenge. And then 10 more states, as, as you see up there, have applications pending for similar work requirements. Uh, moreover, 
this policy is just one aspect. Nick capitalizes this when he, when he writes. <laughs> this is just one aspect of the Trump administration's efforts to transform Obamacare. As this next slide shows, seven states have received permission to change eligibility requirements uh, for the poorest recipients of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, things uh, such as premium surcharges for those who use tobacco, and that is posed on beneficiaries who, who do not participate in, tobac in tobacco cessation activities, as the, as the resolution puts it. Uh, and also uh, being locked out uh, of the insurance market for failing to pay such premiums on time. So the press and pundits viewed the Republicans' inability to repeal Obamacare as a great failure but with a waiver from CMS, state officials now have the opportunity to remake health care for the poor into a more conservative program, to redeploy the most res uh, redistributive features of Obamacare through administrative fiat. And in fact, Medicaid is projected to expand uh, as a result of these decisions. Many of the 17 states that originally resisted Medicaid expansion are now expanding it, but only for a targeted group of, in, of individuals. So, uh, including I, Virginia. Including Virginia. So uh, let me just uh, conclude by saying that, uh, that Trump's uh, uh, um, atavistic connection uh, to his conservative base confirms that he's not to be dismissed or feared as a cult of personality. Uh, for all of the novel features of Trump's presidency, uh, his aggressive use of administrative powers fits squarely within the developments uh, that have been taking place uh, for nearly half a century. Uh, developments that have uh, joined uh, presidential prerogative, partisan polarization, uh, and social activism. And, and in order to erase Obama's legacy, uh, Trump has nourished his, his own partisanships with right-leaning activists who previous presidents and congressional leaders have courted, uh, and his plebiscitory politics, forming a direct, a direct link with the conservative base, is a harsher, more unfiltered version of administrative partisanship uh, than Reagan and Bush and Obama pursued. Now, now much, much of the obsession with, with Trump has focused on his violation of constitutional norms, and Nick and I understand this Totally, we totally understand this obsession. Our only point is to, is to suggest that these developments didn't come from nowhere, that they are connected to powerful dy dynamics that have been developing since the 1960s. So th thanks for your patience, uh, guys. So let's, um, let's take questions. Yeah. So I only think in terms of regression analysis. Um, and so I'm just wondering, like, if you were to control for a divided government and also sort of the, um, the variation within the Republican Party, is Trump different in that he's more likely to engage in this kind of behavior even when he's got Republicans yeah. and those kinds of numbers yeah. on his yeah. side? I was going to talk about that, but it was, I dropped it from the box. Go ahead, Nick. No, I think yeah. we... We find it really interesting that even during the first two years under a unified government, he resorts to this administrative right. strategy right away. I think some you have to account for some of the differences, positional differences that he has with the Republican Party. I think this is clear on issues such as trade. Um, but we just we think that it provides more opportunities. It's, an, it's easier to do. You don't have to cajole your <laughs> members of your own party in Congress. He has uh, eight years of great example using administrative action. As, as Sid said, we have a, a former Republican strategist say he let Obama left a, a loaded administrative weapon on the desk of the Oval Office. Um, so that's how I would begin to approach it. Yeah. And also, uh, a lot of these issues divide the Republican Party. Um, health care, there's a lot of political crosswinds against uh, repealing health care. The Republicans are divided by trade. They're divided by immigration. And one thing I found pretty fascinating, Jen, is how, and this is a real confirmation of executive center partisanship, is how the base's views have, have moved in the direction dramatically of Trump's position on things like health care uh, and trade uh, and, Im and immigration, 
uh, policy. And even though there's still some disagreements between Trump and the Republican establishment in Washington over these issues, the base is bought in on these issues. Really interesting, if you follow Pew survey over the 2016 campaign, Republican identifiers and, and uh, Republican-leaning independents shift from about one-third support for protectionism to two-thirds support of protectionism over the 2016 campaign. And so this is the, why Trump keeps such a vital connection through tweets uh, and, uh, and, these, and these mass rallies with, with his base. So this, this, this uh, administrative politics is not just a matter of divided government, as important as it is. It, it's also this, this powerful momentum to do things administratively that have been building for a pretty long time. And I'll, and I'll add, just because it would be nice if anybody else has some insights, a lot of this paper and a lot of our thinking about it so far has been about domestic policies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about how the president's commander-in-chief powers and control of the military, the freedom from fear matters for, mm -hmm. for those living within the American state. I find it really interesting that the greatest degree of pushback from Republicans has been on the president's foreign policy. And I, I have trouble reconciling maybe that with some of our, right? It's just areas that we need to think a little bit more about. Yeah. I don't think it's been necessarily consequential. You have a couple of resolutions passed yeah. condemning the administration's approach and policies, and you've seen some slight adjustments, but in domestic policies. Um, mm -hmm. I think Mark Short told Sid once, and Mark Short was interviewing here at the, the notorious Mark Short. Short. I, I think it wasn't off the record, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh said, I'm not you know, sure. yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis, you would have members of the con Congress come and ask the administration to tweet controversial issues to kind of take pressure off of them. <laughs> you know, executive Senate partisanship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can I just ask one follow-up to this, though? Um, so when I think about the foreign policy piece, the public has moved, right? Like, so the public now views sort of Putin the way Trump does, right? Or, you know, and well, so. Yeah, actually, that even started before Trump. Yeah, it yeah. started during yeah. Bush president. Um, yeah. So. During Obama's president, yeah. Sorry. yeah. Right, so, but, but in some ways it was just because Obama had the views that he had, that meant that Republicans had to, yeah, you know, yeah. sort of move in the other direction. And so, I guess I'm just wondering, like, like, are you able to, so I think the argument is compelling, but are you able to show that sort of the confluence of these factors and increased party polarization has made it that much worse. Made it worse than, than what partisanship existed for the practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I don't know that we, I don't know that we've shown that. Um, what, what I, you know, it's going to sound terribly um, amoral, but a, a lot of my uh, immersion in this stuff is to figure out what's happened. <laughs> and, and you know, I, I, I wrote a book where I was pretty critical of New Deal pragmatism. Um, and now people refer to this uh, criticism as neoliberal, the neoliberalism uh, of, of the New Deal. And I've always, as my students here know, I've always liked partisan polarization. I, I think it's. Uh, oh, I think it's good. I, I think apathy is, as Tobel said, apathy, uh, not polarization, is the great uh, problem. It's also I helped women. So my problem with it is, is it's become so so executive centered. The presidentialism has, has come to overawe partisanship, and I think that denigrates parties as collective organizations for the past and the future. But the polarization, the debate had to come. It, it had to come after the 60s occurred, I think. Sure, yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. It's yeah. very convincing and um, very interesting. I have a um, general question. Could you tell me who you are? Tim Brennan. Hmm. Uh, general question. Where are you from? Uh, Australia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I yeah, yeah. You. Yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah. If I have, I'm sorry, I'm remembering. <laughs> no, it's all right. Um, specific question is you're just talking about administrative power here so you're, you're comparing the ex, the, the move to redeploying rather than retrenching administrative power yeah. among conservatives in power with conservatives in power before the 1960s when there was an administrative state mm -hmm. so you're just comparing it with Eisenhower I assume yeah yeah but did, but did he at all move to, to retrench administrative power? I mean, he may not have expanded it at the current rate. In other words, the question is, did anyone, has anyone in power, when there's been an administrative state, moved to retrench? And if not, may that 
might that be another explanation? Just yeah. that when you have the power, yeah. it's very yeah. unlikely that yeah, you're I, going to retreat. Another way I think that's a great, great yeah. point, great question. We do have a, a lot about Eisenhower. Okay. In, in the paper, you know. I mean, another way of rephrasing that is who's the example of the constitutional conservative that we're holding up here and when did they exist? Yeah. I don't think Eisenhower would meet that definition. Uh, that goes beyond the confines of this particular paper. And, uh, you know, in, in my work uh, on, on state and local politics and the way that Eisenhower built administrative apparatuses to move policy in, in the state and localities, I think he fits in this vein, although not as aggressively rhetorically bombastically. Um, I think you have to go before the New Deal state. I mean, if Eisenhower is your only Republican fire to crack up in the 1960s, uh, I guess one part of the aspect, I guess the, the answer yeah. to your question would be once you get the New Deal state, uh, conservatives and, and liberals bought into it. It was just only until Nixon that you actually have a conservative in that position to be able to wield that power. Uh, we, we draw a lot on, although gold, I mean, I, I, the reason we belabor the point on Goldwater is Goldwater in 64 is preaching a very different message than Nixon in 68. And even though people have tried to connect, connect them because of their populist overtones, because of the extremism, um, their view of presidential government, their view of what ailed America is, is very different. They prescribe very different actions. Only one of them won. You know, I, I would just add that Eisenhower uh, sort of embraced New Deal pragmatism. You know, wrote this famous letter to his brother Edgar, anybody tries to repeal the New Deal, any party tries to do that will be, uh, I forget the exact term yet, but banished from American politics. Uh, and and uh, so he tried to uh, advance a kind of moderate form of New, new, uh, of new Deal programs. Like he, had, he, he uh, with the Republican Congress in 1954, expanded Social Security. And of course, the national highway system, which is sort of a, his, his version of what the New Deal state should do, uh, private infrastructure, yeah. uh, was, was, was a, might, might have been the biggest public program we've ever had in the United States. Yeah. So, so, what's, uh, so comparing Nixon and Eisenhower is, is useful. Now, the interesting question for me is what if Goldwater got elected in six months? Would, yeah, <laughs> would, would he have acted as Nixon did? And that would show just this power of the administrative idea that is advanced by the, by the New Deal. And you can't really go before Eisenhower, if I understand you, because right, there's no administrative state in the modern sense for Eisenhower. But I'd be interested to know. I don't. I don't know the answer to this. Has there been any government, if you just go more yeah. broadly, than administrative power in American history that has yeah. really systematically retrenched governmental power? Yeah, 1920. If you look at the three Republican presidents, went back with they, they, yeah, they right. rolled things back. Okay. I mean, uh, Coolidge's tax policy. Okay. Yeah, which was not supply side economics. So there was a substantial cut. In, in government spending as yeah. well, of course. The, so, Mellon, the Mellon plan. So this project began with a kind of a simple question. Like, if we just look at, if we just think about budgets as a representation of the state, which we don't think it captures a lot of these actions, but if we just think about the fiscal presence of the governmentality in the United States, has it actually decreased over the last 50 years? And no. Had, despite all the rhetoric about limited government, despite all the concerns about a, a Republican coming in and cutting government and a Democrat coming in and rolling it back, it's been remarkably stable. Yes, and we, I love. Yeah, we, and oh, we should have showed these. We should have showed more graphs. We got we got four of these. <laughs> um, and and Jim is, I, I, we get we get we get some love. I see I see you know a, a text coming in from Jim with a part on it. <laughs> Finally, some graphs. Banish that history. <laughs> and there, there, there's a lot of explanations for this. And we go to great lengths in the paper to explain how our theory, you know, it, it can't explain divided government and budgets, right? That you need to get, the president can say whatever he wants in his budget. He still needs to get Congress to pass appropriations for it. So Congress presidential relationships have to account for something in here. But we think there's a lot uh, that, that isn't explained by these patterns of stability um, that we try to hit at by pointing to administrative yeah. actions. And we don't think like Paul Pearson is just path dependency because yeah. there's a real deep, there's a real uh, attempt to change the, direct, the, tra the trajectory of administration program. Jim, I'm sorry. <coughs> so the big question in APD studies when you're doing this kind of thing is what's your origin point? And I think it follows up in your question. Mm -hmm. And I think your origin point is a little bit early. My question is, why did you pick your point, which you're trying to explain? Mm -hmm. But I think you go back 
Let's go back to the 1800, 18th uh, century. I thought you were going to take us back I to the Civil War. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we, we really have to go back to the Civil War. The transformation <laughs> point is is a shift from tariffs to income tax. Yeah. And your New Deal is a shift from income from tariffs to income tax. And the Republican Party prior to that, the Whigs, the Federalists, all supported big government. They all supported big government, and they supported freedom from fear. What uh, uh, U.S. Grant wanted to have a social welfare program after the panic of 1873. You have a uh, Rockwell up there with Turkey. So the Republican Party provides all these federal fund, federal funds for agriculture. Yeah. You know, so. I guess it depends on how you define administrative state. Does it not include all aspects of the federal government right. without uh, providing functions? Yeah. And just so my question is, follow me here, shouldn't you be going back a lot farther? Yeah. And, and yeah. not yeah. a follow question. The hardest thing in writing this paper is that every day it's changing and every day you want to add something new. And we really are trying to, I think, confine our, our focus to administrative actions. Um, you know, things that the president has almost unilateral capacity and authority to accomplish by using the tools of administrative management, fiscal control after an appropriations has been issued, things such as waivers. Um, these are happening mainly within the executive branch with very little actual oversight from the Congress. I, I, th there's a lot of examples we could also pull in, but we think it might sit outside of a, a strict emphasis on redeployment of administrative power. And to redeploy administrative power, you have to have the administrative apparatus, which we really pegged to the 1930s, 1939. Yeah. I'm just saying, could you characterize this as small state versus big state? And it's maybe not the way to do it. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really uh, compelling point. Uh, Ant and I wrote a piece, remember this, Ant, on, on the Gilded Age and uh, progressive era, where we talked about how through uh, Republicans, uh, particularly Theodore Roosevelt, you get the beginnings of an effort to, to build a national state. But none of that is really, particularly if you look at the 1920s, Jim, none of that becomes enduring or consolidated until after the New Deal. And, and that's why we, we stopped here. But I, I, you know, I've, I've, I'm really interested in the progressive era. A lot of these ideas about administration really have their start during the progressive era. But conservatives during the progressive era, like William Howard Taft, were, were really still uh, strongly committed to limited constitutional government. And the 1912 campaign where Theodore Roosevelt challenges him in the primaries and then the general election is a great debate uh, about uh, what role government should play in American society with Taft uh, taking a, a very uh, traditional conservative side uh, and Theodore Roosevelt making the kind of arguments that, that I thought the, uh, freedom, because you played, I thought freedom from fear and uh, freedom from want was still up there, the, the kind of trajectory that we see with the New Deal. But I definitely think the seeds are there earlier. So speaking of that slide, which you said you didn't want to talk about. No, we didn't say that. No, we didn't. no we're happy to put more. We, 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 right. we got it. We got it. Yeah, no, we I got it. It's just not. About, it's not usually my media, but we got it. No, no, I don't mean this. I mean the freedom from fear. Freedom from. Oh, 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 oh okay, yeah. yeah. Could we? Could we look at it? Yeah. No, I don't want the pictures. The policies. Oh, oh, well, so you want the words? Oh, why not the picture? No one wants words, Paul. No one wants words. Okay. Well, you can turn them into numbers, but so. <laughs> Come on, Jim. <laughs> Even you use words. So I get freedom. I get the freedom from fear column a, a little bit better than I yeah. mm -hmm. comprehend the arguments for. And so I was hoping you could say just a little bit more mm -hmm. about why these are, why you want to group these. Sure. Uh, yeah, this, was, this was Nick's genius to categorize him. <laughs> I guess that means he's punning. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not punning. I'm happy to talk, but I just want to get, I talk long enough. No, um, so we, I think freedom from fear and freedom from want match up to this, I think it's in parallel with conversation with the national security state and then the national welfare state. Um, we started with this example of the ORR to show that instruments of state control and power in the national welfare state can be changed. We can change the day-to-day -day activity of civil servants to make them work in, to advance the objectives of the homeland security state or the national security state. Um, within those broad silos, we think that you can ratchet up 
the objectives. You can be a more aggressive and ardent defender or in pursuit of We use that ratchet up advisedly. Um, <laughs> That's the wall analogy. <laughs> unilaterally, I mean, we didn't mention the big elephant in the room with the wall, but I mean, the idea that you could build this using emergency powers that are coded in language, coded in statute as essentially tiny little administrative maneuvers in pursuit of not only an ideological goal, but a goal to mobilize the base. Okay, so you understand freedom from fear. Freedom from what? I agree, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. It's a little bit more difficult to find examples. Um, but in the paper, the example that I think we think illustrates it best is if you look at the administrative actions. So restructuring the organization, taking resources from one place and moving them to another. If you look at what's taking place in the Department of Education, I think Betsy DeVos, whatever her rhetoric, whatever her past positions, that's all the news coverage. If you look what's actually taking place, you've seen a reduction in the amount of resources that have been targeted to the Office of Civil Rights. And it's not that the Department of Education has diminished in size, in fact, those have been reinserted in the Department of Student Loans mm -hmm. and debt collection within the Department of Education. So the overall size of the Department of Education has relatively stayed the same. We would say the presence of the Department of Education and its effect on the day-to-day -day operations of, of, uh, or day-to-day -day effects on Americans' lives have stayed the same. But rather than fighting for uh, civil rights protections, now it's aggressively pursuing student loan debt collection. Yeah. I get that. So I, okay. I, that makes sense. I get that. Yeah, I get yeah. That's part of the story. I, I yeah. trying to make that fit under the rubric of freedom from want yeah. is a little distracting for me, right? Yeah. It seems like I, yeah, yeah. More we, we try, we were, it's not in the paper, but Nick thought we should try it out. And I, I, I thought it was kind of interesting because I mean, it, like if you could show that the way this redeployment is framed yeah. by, you know, by the boss or by the administration, draws upon this kind of rhetoric then then I'd oh, say I yeah. yeah like but but if not I don't see how more aggressively going after student loan delinquencies right is like how why I should think that that's freedom from for the debt collector it's the, the, who's, <laughs> who's wanting there's the debt yeah. collector if you were my son with big college debts and Obama had gone far to reform the uh, college uh, debt system and Trump has, has, has restored uh, a, a pro, a, a series of, of rules and regulations that benefit the, the debt collectors. So that's a okay. So that's not a about that's not a banishing of Obama's policies. That's a redirection. Of okay. So I so if we're really thinking about freedom from one as from the, for the debt collectors, then I buy it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but I think Medicaid waivers is a is a clear example that that you have a policy that's redistributed that's being redesigned. As one so yeah, and I would buy that if, if if you can show, as I think you were suggesting, that that this, it's being justified, it's being framed in terms of, you know, creating rules that are going to be better for the recipients. I mean, that may be right or oh, wrong, yeah. but yeah. anyway, I, I, no, I just, I don't, no, I, it's, I, like, it's this isn't as coherent to me as the freedom from fear was. Yeah, and that was, that's the big, that's the yeah. bigger point, but it is, you know, it is interesting to me. Uh, the way these waivers are, are defended, not as benefiting the the, the, the beneficiaries, right. but in making sure they behave responsibly. So this this conservative idea of rugged individualism that, that goes back to Herbert Hoover is you, you see rhetoric like the, like that in the defense uh, of, of of these Medicaid waivers. You know, I would even say like some of the DeVos stuff on on the Title IX changes. She can She seems to frame it in terms of protections Protecting for men, accused, right? Like these yeah. accused, exactly. you know, men. Yeah, yeah. So in that case, I'd move it over into the freedom from fear column in yeah. that sense, right? Yeah. Because there's the yeah. rhetoric yeah. of of enhanced protection, yeah. or, or just maintain this distinction between freedom from fear. Yeah. yeah, in the paper we don't have it this way. Right. No, I know. Yeah. Right. So right. so uh, maybe we should we should go back to the original framing. Yeah. Cal? Yeah. So um, my comment is similar to Paul's and I think it's sort of within this conversation that we're having. So I struggled with this slide initially as well, but how I sort of came, and, and I think this is consistent with the conversation that you're having, how I sort of came to understand it was that when you're talking about the redeployment, right, of sort of state power, right, 
Um, it seems to me that it's sort of swinging back depending on who the party is, right? Sort of predictably from sort of positive redeployment versus negative redeployments in some sense, where the liberal regimes or the democratic regimes are trying to extend um, you know, these freedom of want, freedom from fear to people, marginalized groups who hadn't had, who hadn't enjoyed these freedoms in the past, right? Whereas it seems that conservative regimes typically are trying to sort of return things back to the sort of grander historical American status quo in terms of the groups that have power. And I think that's precisely what you see here Right, it's, it's about the groups that want, right? And so in other words, like when you're rescinding labor protections for LGBTQ community, in, you know, in the federal contractors, right? You're, you're sort of, it's, it's this sort of negative redeployment where you're trying to sort of return back to the status quo where these marginalized groups yeah. don't have the same sort of access. Yeah. You're not getting rid of the contract. Yeah. Yeah. You're benefiting the, the contractor yeah. groups that yeah. right. benefited Absolutely. prior to these protections. Absolutely, and I think you're seeing that too with the Department of Education, right, where you're shifting resources away from you know the Title IX restrictions and away from the Office of Civil Rights and directing them elsewhere, right, and this, this advantages <coughs> groups that have historically been uh, privileged in American society, right? Those men, um, that vote white for the folks. administration, which in this yeah, case. Absolutely. So yeah. I think yeah. that this makes sense, but just sort of maybe bringing in more explicitly some of these racial and uh, gender dynamics and things like that could be useful. Yeah. Although the freedom from fear is sort of backwards too, right? Because like they're generating fear. Yeah. Right? So like you should be afraid. That's why we're going to do these things. Whereas, like when you think about the Cold War protections or the way that that language was mm -hmm. used, it like like that Daisy ad was seen as so sort of controversial and crazy and over the top. And now we get that on a daily basis. Yeah, right. right. That's and, why be the re the routine the way this occurred. Right. Yeah. And so, like I think both the terms sort of. Conf um, are, are a little bit backwards because, like, you can, you can, for the freedom from want, it's like we're giving the people that don't want, that don't need the want, the want. Right. And from the freedom <laughs> from fear, like, we're making people scared so we can That's then do these things. Yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> this is great. That, um, uh, this is great. These are great comments. I would, I would only say, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little reluctant, Cal, to say just its return to equilibrium because there's an aggressiveness here that's really not encompassed by the, the term return to normalcy, uh, the term that uh, Warren Harding used. For example, in, uh, in, um, with uh, defense, uh, rescinding labor protections for defense, uh, for federal contractors, uh, what the Trump administration has done ex even more aggressively than Bush was extend uh, expansive resources uh, to defense contractors. And, and what's the figure, Nick, that they're now, more money is spent on defense contractors, private contractors, and on all uh, civilian members of the federal government combined. So there's been a huge surge in, in contract money uh, going uh, to, to defense industries. So, you know, it's not just a, a return to, to equilibrium. At the same time, I acknowledge with Paul, it's not, that's not easily described as repurposing freedom from money. I mean, one Does that make sense? That, yeah. yeah. It's much more aggressive and, as, as, as Jen was suggesting, polarizing. Uh, Eisenhower was sort of a, a little effort to return to equilibrium, this is, this is much more aggressive. This is really an attempt uh, to build, an, in spite of the rhetoric, uh, to build a kind of administ conservative administrative core. Uh, and there are a lot of experienced people working for the Trump administration who are very sophisticated with this. Uh, Jim, you want to come oh, See, Can we get time yeah, first because you haven't had a So I'm just curious about the relationship between sort of intellectual conservatism and this this administrative state, because yeah. you mentioned Harry Jaffa, and I know a lot of the students supported him, but one of them was on the short list for Secretary of Education, said his goal would be to abolish the Department of Education, but they yeah. still support him. So uh, even though he's not doing exactly what they said right. they would support him to do. So it's yeah. just kind of curious about this relationship in general. Are, are they feigning 
demantling the administrative state just as Trump is, or they're really for deploying it, or I mean, how does... You mean, who do you mean? Who, who, the, the intellectuals. Who oh, intellectuals. So, so how, how, does, how does the conservative intellectual movement... <laughs> That's why we really wanted Jim Caesar to be here. Yeah, today. Caesar I'm chicken out. We wanted to... <laughs> no, <but laughs> it's, just, I mean, it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult question, because we are essentially saying that at least for the last 50 years, a lot of this conserv limited conservative government um, <coughs> has not, does not meet the reality. So I think there's a, I think our framework explains why the Koch brothers, a libertarian organization that do not, will not involve themselves in the yeah. next election and in parted ways with the Trump administration. Because the Trump administration is interfering in private markets. It's, inter it's picking winners and losers. It's using the powers of the state to change the way private corporations behave. It's not limiting government, it's picking winners and losers. And that's not a limited government position, that's a big government position, but for conservatives. But they were big in the prison reform stuff, right? The co, the co, co brothers, brothers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there are, so there's different policy. So they would get involved policy-wise, but not in terms of supporting the party as a party or Trump as Trump. They've, yeah, so there was just a yeah. big meeting among them uh, about last month ago, and some of this is personal dynamics in the Coke network, David is dying and Charles is taking over, yeah. more than you might care to know. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, they've already they've already said they will not get involved in 2020, um, because regardless of who, they said, regardless of who the Republican uh, nominee will be, because they've been betrayed by the Republican Party. Um, they're not a libertarian party, they're not a limited government party, I think that's one of the, the takeaways from our paper. Um, yeah. Uh, this question of intellectual is interesting. So, so people like Bill Kristol, it's oh, yeah. amazing, you know, started this, this kind of iconic conservative magazine. It's gone. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Trumpism has killed it. Uh, it's been put out of business. And, and Bill is more of a conservative with a, a small c. Uh, he uh, really abhorred a, a, a lot of this uh, aggressive right. uh, administration. There are other intellectuals who uh, are maybe conservatives with, with the big C in the way we're talking about them, who believes there has to be really aggressive administrative action to deconstruct, as, as, as Bannon put it, the liberal state. Um, and, and maybe they feel once you, uh, that you, once you uh, destroy this liberal state, the conservative um, pro procedures and, and regulations put in place that seem to be awfully statist, they will wither away. You know, we're, 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 we heard that, that before. Uh, but they've been very resistant uh, to accepting the fact that what Trump is about is not, not draining the swamp. We've got some figures on that, too. Uh, but in fact, uh, re repurposing it in important ways. So EPA has lost people, but Defense and Homeland Security have, have, have gained a lot of people. We have, we have numbers on, on So what is that? So he's dredging people. the swamp, right? He, he's he's uh, so moving the muck. Yeah, he's dredging. the muck from I'm one side of the such, swamp to the other. We're getting such great analogies. But, but, you know, when you look at the Republican Party, it's become the Trump Party. Right. I mean, it's, it's the, I've argued for 30 years that we, we were developing an executive center partisanship. I didn't, in my wildest dreams, I didn't think it would be as dramatic as we've seen with the Trump presidency. And again, the numbers, all these controversial issues, trade, uh, immigration, health care, it's, it's really dramatic. Time. So all caveats aside that a president's budget, again, means nothing until Congress passes an appropriation. When we were just drafting this paper, the president, he released his first budget, each budget after that, I haven't looked at the most recent one though, the, for the year after that, mirrored this, size of government actually expands. I think this is a purely symbolic document. There's no other reason to write it this way other than to send a message as to where my priorities are. Um, and if you look at Reagan's first budget, if you look at W's first budget, I've never looked at HW's first budget. If you look at Nixon's first budget, they all follow this pattern of, Government's going to expand for a short period of time, then we'll use some econometric techniques to say that it's going to then start decreasing, but redeployment. The amount of money that they take away from the Department of State, HHS, Ed, and HUD is immediately offset by other agencies. Mm -hmm. And supply side economics is huge and it goes along with this kind of conservative state. And it's a big departure, back to your point, that, uh, from traditional conservatives like Coolidge who didn't believe. Uh, you should run deficits. You can't, if you're going to cut taxes, you have to do something about spending. Um, so, yeah. Go back to that, the want and fear thing. So, do, <laughs> I think building on what Tyler said in terms of intellectual, maybe just movement conservatism, 
I'm looking at some of this, and up until Trump, the freedom from fear side, I'm thinking the development of a neoconservative state. The freedom from want side, I think it gets a little bit more complicated because I think there's a few different types of activities that could potentially be going on here. Deregulation, I just kind of see as that's just taking something off of the books. Yes, that's going to benefit somebody as to others, but right, that's getting something off the books. But even on this side, what about like say religious conservatives and they're act they're also building elements of the administrative state, whether it's an office of you know faith based initiatives or something else. Yeah. So the Yeah, so your work on faith based initiatives I think fits into this people that showed that and, and the biggest pushback we get from conservative intellectuals is they don't want to own the W. Bush administration. That was the aberration. That was that's a special type of conservatism. Um, we clearly situated within a trajectory of conservative thought and conservative use of the administrative state, at least going back to Nixon. Yeah. How interesting to think more about Eisenhower. Yeah, but, but the term movement conservatism is a good one. That's, that's more direct than big C, <laughs> and more, I think, uh, more descriptive than big C, small C. Uh, and, and what's fascinating is this merger of, uh, of uh, movement politics and executive power. Richard. So, you know, when we're talking about this, where a Republican president is using the administrative state in a way that's sort of, you know, antithetical to the goals of the conservative movement or something like that, it brings me to a, a bigger question here, which is, so, Nick, you sort of identified this early on as the president being responsive to party preferences, right? So, like, what is the motivation for building this administrative state if the president is creating preferences through, you know, taking policies and then public opinion following him, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? Is this really being responsive to party preferences, per se? Like, you know, sort of what's motivating this buildup in administrative power? He asked you. No, I'm, thinking, I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to capture the question. I don't yeah, know if I yeah. fully understand it, to be honest. You, you're, you're asking about the relationship between this administrative mm -hmm. power and public opinion. Well, I'm just saying, like, so if, if the president is being responsive to party preferences here, how can we also see sort of the administrative state be deployed in a way that's not in line with party preferences and yet begins to shape party preferences, right? So, like, it's just sort of a question uh, uh, of what's motivating. Yeah, this. I would I, I would just say my my short answer to the question, uh, Richard, is this is uh, presidents just don't respond to party preferences. We have okay. to think carefully. Uh, and and I, I would love to work with uh, behavioralists. <laughs> Rachel and I will work, we'll, we'll do a project on this. And, uh, we'll bring Paula into it uh, too. Uh, I, I think presidents uh, have a lot to do with shaping part, partisan preferences. And partisan preferences have to be distinguished from public opinion. I mean, the, the, uh, the fascinating thing is uh, Trump has, has been, we, I, you know, a lot, if you watch CNN, uh, as, as my wife and I do every night, <coughs> kind of, it's doing. kind of like this perverse therapy. You know, we can't we can't get away from it. All they talk about is Russia, <laughs> you know, uh, and and and, uh, and scandals and uh, Trump's uh, the absence of a, any kind of record of a, a policy accomplishment. But if you look at as Nick and I have at, at the administrative actions that have taken place directed at, uh, at the base, uh, there's there's been a substantial amount. Of, of activity, but not directed. This is a fascinating thing. I don't know how this is going to play out. Not to, directed to the median voter, you know, not directed to building a majority coalition, but to establishing a strong uh, support at the base of the party, uh, thinking somehow that's going to sustain you uh, through, through elections. And Trump felt vindicated by that strategy in 2016 and, and is, is still playing that pretty much that, that, that uh, game. And, as, as we move towards towards 2020. But this, uh, as a lot of scholars, like, uh, um, um, I'm trying to think of, of her name, um, uh, Francis Lee uh, have argued a lot of this uh, partisan conflict uh, uh, is, 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 is uh, animated or, or generated by the fact that neither the Democrats or the Republicans have a secure majority. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she argues uh, that with the decline of the New Deal political order, that that incentivizes partisan uh, tactics in, in Congress. She doesn't talk very much uh, about the presidency. What she underestimates is how this ta these tactics, I think, are connected to ideology uh, and mobilization. And she also <coughs> doesn't connect it to this administrative action. So when she and I talk about Trump, I mean, it's like we're not talking to each other. 
She's saying, oh, they can do one thing. There's nothing to worry about. Madison will win out in, in the day. And, and if, if you take a close look at that, you have to be much more circumspect about uh, claiming that the Madisonian system will defeat Trumpism. Because this is stuff that's been going on for half a century. And, you know, Obama worked against the Madisonian system in some pretty important ways. Does that, does that answer yeah. your question? Uh, Jim? I'm just going on this last point. What you're talking about is, first, at one point you're talking about limiting government, visions of government being what's the purpose, and that's one dimension. The other thing you're talking about is administrative state. And it sounds to me like the president's ability to run the executive branch. Because okay. he wants to redeploy people, we want to redeploy people. It's happened in the past. They get to appoint people anyway. Uh, but then there's the policy element. And I'm wondering, a lot of this is about power. Ministry of State, you're arguing the president is able to do these things now, which suggests there's a, a loss of power by somebody else. And I'm wondering if you're dealing with the role of Congress here and the courts. I mean, if it was a vacuum that was constitutionally available, in which these presidents have filled naturally, or if somebody else chose or lost power, and so our, our senator, senator uh, says from Virginia says we should have redressing of the presidential power. Congress is right to declare war, and we shouldn't have that <coughs> presidential war acts. I'm just wondering, what's, what's the loss of power? And is it conscious by Congress and the courts? Or is it just mm -hmm. a natural void that's being fitted by the, by the president? Mm -hmm. But the first, Great question. the first part of your framework <coughs> got me thinking about a, a line we quoted so often by uh, Richard Nixon's deputy director of the OMB, Richard Nathan, said, operations is policy. Administration is policy. You can move policy through these administrative means. So we're, we're, we, we play on that um, pretty considerably. But I, I think I would agree with you fully. Um, this is a loss of power by Congress. I think some of it's been an unintentional loss of power. Um, I still think Ted Lowy's framework for understanding the way that a great post great society and post great society statutes are written are enabling statutes. Um, this gives the executive considerable amount of power, whereas New Deal uh, New Deal statutes were restrictive on executive power. Uh, I would just add that not only is Congress losing power, uh, but the states are as well, and they are willing and complicit partners in giving up authority and capacity to change policy to federal agencies, which is also why we dwell mm -hmm. on Medicaid expansion mm -hmm. here. So yeah. something to add to that is I think the changing nature of the media environment plays in because oh, yeah. Yeah. it used to be that Congress could resolve some of its differences behind closed doors or yeah. people wouldn't know and the president couldn't mm -hmm. jump on that and exploit these kinds of like pretty minor fissures that then become you know, blown up. And right. so it's not necessarily that Congress is abdicating power or unable to fill the void. It's that everybody's watching. And, you the know, Gingrich sort of, reforms of the Congress. Yeah. 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 And of course, the, and that's, and that's consistent also, like when Gingrich came to power, that's also consistent with the beginning of the 24 hour news cycle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in both of those have, you know, sort of grown disproportionately insane. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the breakdown of the of the media establishment, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post of this more fragmented partisan media, which Paul knows a lot more about than I. Uh, of course, that's, that's a really important parallel development. Now, what kind of independent fact that has, whether that you know is a symptom of this or a partial fun. No, but I do think it it allows the president to I like say, well, I have to move. Look at how yeah. look at how Congress isn't able to get yeah. anything done, and well, you just gave him twelve seconds. Well, and right. Congress cuts its own staff levels in the same budget that it expands the executive office. Right. Yeah, you know, as Terry Moe says, the president has the an advantage and uh, doesn't have the uh, the same uh, issues. Uh, doesn't have the same collective action problem yeah. that, that Congress has, and, and the courts to a point don't either. I've been fascinated by this this effort to, to you know, presidential elections are as much about controlling the courts as anything else right now. And it is fascinating that uh, if you look at the Federalist Society and the doctrine they push, it's awfully deferential to executive power. Although that's Very, the one thing Trump has like, been totally deferential to. Right, so like that's yeah. the one area where like he hasn't veered from the Federalist Society judges, and it's the one area yeah. where he's been most successful, like yeah. in terms of like there have been no that, like you didn't back down on Kavanaugh. One normal person wouldn't have backed down on Kavanaugh, <laughs> and it worked, yeah. right? Like more uh, more appellate uh, judges than any other president. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I'm just, Please. just curious. When you're dealing with, you're starting off with talking about uh, Trump and the children. And I'm wondering why you don't compare Trump's policies in a comparative sense, analytically, to Obama and George W. H. W. or, or W. policies on children. Because yeah. both of them tried to deal with this and they decided to step away from it because it was too politically sensitive. And so there was sort of a housing of, of the children for a while, but they, under Obama, they lost 10,000 children. They lost track of them. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, can you do some more? We need to do some more baseline work there. there. <laughs> That's another baseline. We have. As we're thinking about, we're thinking about if this, if there's, if we think there's enough here for a book. And if, if it was organized, how would we organize it? And I think the best approach would be to look at agency histories and look how agencies have been restructured and how their mission has been redefined across different mm -hmm. administrations. We do the Obama-Trump comparison in this paper and another paper uh, that we did only nine months into the Trump administration where we tried to make those comparisons a little bit cleaner. <coughs> this is how the Obama administration tried to handle it and why, what administrative approaches they used, and this is how using very similar techniques of power, instruments of power, the Trump administration was able to serve very different objectives. And Obama deport, deported more people than Trump. Deporter in chief. Yeah. One more thing on the during, during. tariffs. Yeah. The Democratic Party opposed the, the uh, NAFTA. Yeah. So how do you, would you characterize that as a freedom from fear should have been not having the NAFTA in the first place? So to characterize freedom from yeah, because it took away all Paul, jobs. Paul's warned me about getting too entangled <laughs> in this dimension now. Yeah. Well, we don't. I mean, so the last thing we want to do is gloss over important intra-party distinctions. Um, but any type of big theory is going to do that. Um, what we hope to leverage from this dichotomy is an, it's to challenge this basic and prevailing idea that conservatives come in and try to dismantle and liberals come in and try to build up. We don't, and, and as important as rhetoric is, changing people's minds and setting the terms of debate, pushing the agenda, you know, we care about the actions, and what they've actually done. And when you look at what both parties have done, they both aggressively use state power. That's why I kind of like the dichotomy of saying that the parties turn that on their heads, right? Yeah. Like the way that they've defined these two categories is fundamentally right. at, at fundamental odds with one another. Yeah, yeah during exactly. the New Deal, they were seen, seen as consistent with each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One, I really appreciate the, the, the comments that like Paul uh, have made about that that's a clear frame. Um, I, I would um, uh, just say to, to Jim real quickly, because I know we're out, out of time, but uh, the dynamic between Obama and the uh, immigration rights as what well, movement in the LGBTQ movement is really interesting uh, because uh, this is not just presidential usurpation. This is the connection of presidential power to movement politics and both influence each other. And Obama moved, evolved as he put it, uh, to much more progressive positions. And, and those he took in Im immigration uh, were really aggressive. We think of DACA, but DAPA, the, the, one, the, the protections that were extended uh, to, uh, to uh, parents of permanent residents and citizens, that was like 4.5 million people that were not only given protection from deportation, but were given these work authorizations, which are huge. You get a license, you get a job, there's evidence, there's graphs that show that this leads to economic <laughs> well-being. So uh, Obama's trajectory, you know, kind of started out as kind of a, I want to restore the New Deal uh, enlightened administration. Uh, I'm into pragmatism. But the dynamics of politics now makes it very difficult to govern in that way. And he lost control of the Congress. And he lost control of the Congress. Okay. He, he was totally free yeah. then. Yeah. And, and did more after he lost control of Congress yeah. than he did when he had control of Congress. Well, and these have been amazing. Yeah, I'm you. so thankful for your close attention and these comments, guys. They're really helpful. Thank you. And we will reconvene in March. <laughs> <laughs>